So Colossians 2, 9 to 15, what are we about? Jesus is the best. Amen. <laughs> That's it, long time. <laughs> long time. It's not quite long time. And the reason it's not quite long time is that the people at Colossae have begun to doubt it. And so in practice can we very, very easily. Very, very easily. We begin to doubt that he actually is the best. And that's why this passage is so important to us today. We would not for one minute say, well, actually, we can do a bit better than this carrot, you know, perhaps we could just you know, tweak it a bit here and there. Wouldn't dream of saying a thing like that, would we? No, Simon. But we start to think like it. As if we've got to add something or do something or fiddle around a bit because things are not quite optimal with Jesus. These people at Colossae had been offered better than their simple and authentic experience and understanding of Jesus. It's common, but it's always a con. Three theological issues that Paul picks up in these verses, we'll see in a minute, addressing the way the heretics at Colossae had tried to offer something better than Christianity. Fullness, circumcision, principalities and powers are always the same, they're powers and authorities. When I say principalities and powers, it just shows my age. Don't worry about that. It means powers and authorities, but it doesn't, and we'll see that. Not even this week, but next week. Next week, principalities and powers, here, come. That's the advert. <laughs> There's no evidence they ever said they were leaving the Christian way, these people. We've come down to Colossi causing trouble. The times were hard in Colossi, do you remember? There was a recession. And everybody moved away. And it had its natural impact on business and trade and family life because the young had gone. And so they were feeling a bit empty and jaded and needing a bit more, a bit extra. They, life had had the shine go off it. And that's when people come along and offer you extra and you're vulnerable. They'll never say you're leaving the Christian way. It's usual for Christian deviations to claim that it is they that are authentic. It's usual for them to offer something that is better. That the rest of us poor muppets who just trust in Jesus who died on a cross and rose from the dead and gives us eternal life haven't got. And that's something we need to watch out for. Remember, Paul is deceit-proofing the people of God. Be deceit-proof. So Paul now begins to take this issue full on. The issue of fullness recurs, the idea of circumcision arises again, and the matter of the principalities and powers still needs to get extended exposure to the cross. Now, I, I know those issues themselves may sound a little bit irrelevant at the moment to us, in terms of the areas of possibility for deviation they represent, we're going to see that they're not. Remember in those immediately preceding verses, Paul has been seeking to strengthen the faith of the wavering people in Colossae. They were susceptible to error. This is contemporary, isn't it? They were susceptible to error because their souls weren't in the right place. So Paul doesn't go straight for the error. He goes for the man, he goes for the woman. He says, be, be stronger. Let me help you grow. And he encourages them to be stronger in Christ. He's been seeking to strengthen the faith of these people who might be wavering in Colossae. And what Paul's going to do now, as he moves on from that, is to make plain to the Colossian Christians why this philosophy of the false teachers is not according to Christ. As if he sorted out their hearts and now he moves on to their heads. That's putting it a bit bluntly, right? Let's see how he gets on. Verses 9 and 10, Colossians chapter 2. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head of every power and authority. The issue here is fullness. Fullness, fulfillment. Now, given his experience from the Damascus Road days onwards, 
And given what he's seen during the course of an extensive missionary experience, preaching Christ crucified, raised from the dead, repent and believe. That's basically the Paul, isn't it? There are big books on Pauline theology, but that's what you need. Given his experience of that and seeing what it does, it's no wonder that Paul just majors this all back on Jesus. The whole point of what happened to him, the whole turning point in his life, was he saw Jesus on the Damascus Road, wasn't it? He's walking down the road, he sees this blinding vision of Jesus, and was blinded by it. But given what he knows of his Old Testament, given what he knows of Daniel's prophecy, he recognises in Jesus, the one who is described in Daniel, as the Son of Man. Glorified. Co-regent in Daniel. On the throne of God. It's all about that central Jesus bit. And the readers of this letter are left in no doubt about it by the repetition of the phrase, in him, in Christ, in him. It goes on and on and on through these verses. Repeated, not ad nauseam, but ad penetram, perhaps, get it in. <laughs> right? In him, in him, meaning Jesus. Showing them time and again that the good things they have are good things that they have in Christ. Or the good things that they aspire to but haven't got are because they haven't worked on that union with Christ in the way that they need to. It's functionally in him. In him. And it's worth noting that phrases used here echo the language of the hymn to Christ in chapter 1 verse 19. In him dwells all the fullness. They are phrases that echo the words of chapter 1. That teaching him about Jesus in chapter 1. The first theological issue then is fullness. What does that mean? Everything. Everything. Doesn't mean everything, does it? Because if it meant everything, it would mean nothing. So what it means is, yeah, full up with everything. Yeah, all full. All full up. Yeah. Well, what's the idea of that? Get various ideas about it, but the background for this verse to Colossians 1.19 seems to be that this was a technical term in proto-gnosticism. They had this experience they pushed at you, a la Greek mystery religions, where you were filled up. So you've become a Christian, right? There you are, but now you need to be filled up. And we go through this rigmarole or whatever it happens to be, so that you can be filled up. Now you've seen that because you laughed. <laughs> you've seen that happening in churches. Excellent. You pings out. Now you're filled up. Now you're a proper one. Fullness. It signified all sorts of things in Gnosticism in the second century. It signified the top deck of the ancient spiritual world. It, in the Old Testament it was about the full presence of God where God's glory filled the whole earth. It had a particular relation to Jerusalem, the place where God's glory particularly dwelled. It was full of his glory. And those ideas all seem to come together a little bit in Colossians 1.19, and here too in Colossians 2. All God's fullness dwells in Christ, not in some experience. And it's, it's not a temporary dwelling, like well, putting up your tent. There's a word for that in Greek, it's not that one. This is katoikeo, it is a permanent dwelling in Christ. All God's glory permanently dwells in Christ. Jesus is the one and only mediator, unlike the Gnostic system with loads of mediators, between God and mankind. He's the only one because he joins humanity and divinity in one bodily identity. In him, in him, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. It's united in him. Here's how he comes to be the mediator. In his own person. He's the bridge builder between God and humanity. Joining the two. So the Colossians needn't fear those supernatural powers. The powers that be are not in the planets and trees and what have you, but in Christ. They're not in the elemental spirits of the universe. They're in Jesus. All the fullness that he needs in Jesus Christ. Because he's got the fullness of God in him. The infinite God. God in all his divine essence and power is resident in Christ. There's the background of the text amongst the heretics. They were pushing the idea that it was better than just Jesus. And they were pushing some esoteric experience that got you to this higher, better level. Now we do encounter that sort of thing all around us today. 
don't you? From the old style Pentecostal who insist you need to speak in tongues to have the full works from Jesus, through the RCs who insist you need to be christened to, into the church so that you're part of the church because there's only salvation in the church so you need to join their church, extra to Jesus. Right through to the Christian deviations and the Scientologists and all who insist there are extras added on that you need to make you a full, proper, best you can be believer. And Paul says you receive fullness in Christ. 